This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. What is Chalkboard Chat? It's an MPB education podcast. It's a variety show providing information and resources for teachers, students, parents, guardians, and everyday people on various topics. It's learning something new with every publication. Chalkboard Chat. Find the podcast or listen from chalkboardchat.mpbonline.org. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio. It's a show all about you and your rights. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Hello, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. It is great to be with you this morning. I hope you had a good Halloween. Uh, and lots of trick-or-treaters, if that's your thing. And Unfortunately, today, they didn't eat late. any of my candy, and uh, now we have it. But the husband took our candy to his work to give it out So, because we just sat and ate it all last night ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I, I am going to give mine to my students because I bought a big bag and we had one one trick-or-treater last night, but you know, it was a Monday night. But uh, but today we've got a treat for everyone. I'm really, really happy to welcome uh, Will Bardwell, uh, who is Senior Counsel for Democracy Forward to the show. And Will, good morning. I, I'm a big, I was a big fan of yours on Twitter for a long time before uh, before we had you on the show. And, and, and I think you were on the show when you were with SCLC, but now we're, we're glad to have you back as uh, Senior Counsel for Democracy Forward. So would you please tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved with Democracy Forward? I was going to tell you some of my favorite Twitter threads from last night, but I'll, I'll skip that for, uh, for maybe the green room after the show. Now, I'm, uh, I'm so thrilled to be here with you all. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I have been a huge MPB fan for a long time and, uh, of course, professor, a, uh, an alum of uh, Ole Miss Law School. So thrilled to be here. Uh, at Democracy Forward is a relatively young organization. We were founded in 2017 uh, for the purpose of fighting back against attacks on uh, democratic norms and democratic institutions. Uh, I joined Democracy Forward in uh, February of this year. Before that, spent several years at the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, and before that in private practice and, and clerked for uh, a judge early in my career. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, this is an, a fun topic for me to... Uh, talk to you all about today because public education is sort of a, a core area for me in my practice. Uh, and so just r- really excited to, uh, to chat it up about this. Well, we're, we're excited to talk about it too. We are going to get to um, the, the question of funding private schools uh, with uh, through you know, use of state money or state grants, uh, which you just litigated. But before you get there, what other legal issues does Democracy Forward deal with? Well, when we talk about protecting democratic norms and institutions. And to be clear, we're talking about small d democratic here. Uh, you know, that is, uh, there are a lot of threads that go into tying democracy together. And uh, some of them are very obvious. Some of them are less obvious. Uh, but anytime you cut one of those threads, the, the whole thing becomes a little less bound together. And so they're all important, even the ones that aren't obvious. Uh, voting rights, uh, access to the ballot, obviously, you know, everybody would, would guess that. Uh, but then issues like public education, you know, some people uh, might not immediately see the, uh, the connection between public education and democracy. Uh, but I think everybody also would agree that uh, to be an informed, uh, a functional member of the electorate, um, it's good to have a, a high quality education people who are more highly educated are more likely to vote. Uh, and so it's it's an empowering tool for uh, for someone who's going to grow up and be a voter. Well, that's it's it's great it's, it's a great organization, but how how do they so how does a, an organization like Democracy Forward get involved in you know a case in Mississippi the, the dealing with the constitutionality of the independent school uh, infrastructure grants program that was passed by the Mississippi legislature? So for most of Democracy Forward's first, I guess you would say four years or so, uh, most of DF's work focused on uh, administrative work at the federal level. 
And so those are things. So like, Democracy Forward is a national organization? Yes. We are based in Washington. Uh, I am based here in, in Mississippi. And um, you know, when we talk about administrative law, when you hear about federal agencies uh, passing rules or regulations, uh, there are certain procedures that those agencies have to go through, and sometimes they do it exactly right, and sometimes they don't do it exactly right. And when they do it right, um, you know, that, those are occasionally things we support, and sometimes when they don't do it right, those are things that we uh, oppose. But um, I guess a about a year ago, we started uh, expanding out into doing more litigation work in the states, uh, recognizing that these anti-democratic trends uh, had migrated into the states and that if, if you wanted to take the fight to them, that's where it had to be. And that's, yeah, and so what is, I mean, so we talk, we're gonna talk about the independent school infrastructure grants program today, which is the issue that you litigated uh, in the Chancery Court in Hines County. So um, what was that program? What is that program? Well, it's, uh, there's the what and there's the, uh, there's the how, uh, which are both interesting questions. So at the very end of every legislative session, one of the last things that the Mississippi legislature takes up every year is appropriations bills. And they are usually passed very quickly with very little, if any, debate, uh, much less time for members to actually go through these bills line by line and make sure that they're okay with everything that's, uh, that's going to receive state appropriations. And this was one of the line items that sort of snuck through uh, at the last minute. And in fact, after the legislative session closed, uh, even Republican members of the legislature who learned about this uh, said that if they had known about this, they would not have supported it. Uh, but this grants program uh, was an appropriation of $10 million in federal COVID relief money to hand out to private schools, uh, ostensibly for infrastructure improvements, but uh, the program as a whole had was designed to have uh, virtually no oversight of how that money was spent. Um, and it was strings-free, interest-free, uh, just, uh, just handing it out in chunks of up to $100,000 a piece. Now, the, the problem for the legislature and the, the saving grace for uh, public school children in all this is that Mississippi's constitution contains a provision that forbids exactly what the legislature did here. I, I know we'll get into the details of that later, um, but that in a nutshell is, is how the program worked or was designed to work, I should say. It, it, never, uh, it has been enjoined since then, which I, I suspect we'll get into a little bit of that too. Sure, for sure. Now, so, I mean, all right, so this ends up in litigation. And one of the first things you learn in law school is you've got to have somebody who has standing to bring this case. And like these broad, you know, it's one thing if I'm in an auto accident, it's clear, you know, I have standing if somebody hits me. But, but who has standing in a case like this? That is a great, great question. That's the first question you've always got to answer in litigation, right? And I'm glad you used the example of, uh, it, for example, if you were in a car wreck uh, and you thought that your legal rights had been violated because of that. Obviously, you have standing to bring that because it, you're the one whose legal rights were obligated. But let's say I talked to you on Twitter a few days later, found out about this wreck and was so deeply offended that I wanted to file a lawsuit about it. Well, I can't do that because I haven't been harmed about it. I could be offended by it, but that's not enough to bring a lawsuit. You've got to have standing. Standing standing can mean a few different things depending on whether you're in state court or federal court, but in a nutshell, it's the idea that in order to bring a lawsuit, you've got to have some kind of skin in the game. You, you Your legal rights have to be implicated somehow by this conduct that you allege is unlawful. So in this case, we were in state court in Mississippi. Mississippi's state courts have uh, somewhat more flexible standing requirements than in federal court. Uh, among other things, in Mississippi, uh, we have a thing called taxpayer standing, which is almost non-existent in federal court, but most states like Mississippi have some form of taxpayer standing. In Mississippi, 
a taxpayer will have standing to uh, attack an illegal government expenditure. So an, an unconstitutional appropriation to private schools, for example. The idea is that as a taxpayer, you have an interest in the, the fisc, the public fisc, where your, your tax dollars have gone. And that if, that if the resources in that pocketbook are being appropriated toward illegal purposes, then you are suffering an injury as a taxpayer. Now, again, in federal court, that, that's almost never available. But in most states, taxpayer standing is available to attack illegal government spending. Uh, and so that was uh, that that was the door into the courthouse for us, uh, so to speak. Fantastic. And we're going to get to more of that. We would love for you to join us and be part of our show. If you have a question or a comment, you can send us an email with your questions or comments to legal terms at mpbonline.org. We're discussing giving public funds to private schools with our guest, Will Barnett, Senior Counsel with Democracy Forward. I might add a 501c3 organization if you want to contribute to that. Uh, sorry, uh, Bart Well, And we are learning about, you know, what it means to be an informed member of the electorate. So if you're planning to vote absentee, that's I'm trying to that was my segue to get there. Uh, absentee for the general election next Tuesday. I'm going to give you some information next. Not everybody has a chance to listen to the whole show live. So if you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show from our website in legal terms dot mpb online dot org. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. So if you need to vote absentee before Tuesday, because Tuesday is Election Day, uh, beginning September 24th, absentee ballots were available at the county circuit clerk's office. Now, this Saturday, November 5th, in-person absentee voting deadline at the county circuit clerk's office, they will be open until noon for in-person absentee voting. They're also open all this week. But on Saturday, they'll be open until noon. Now, next Tuesday, November 8th, is the general election and regular special election day. Polls open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you're in line before 7, you still get to vote. And November 8th is also the mail-in absentee ballots must be postmarked on or before that date to be valid. And one thing, our Secretary of State's office has a fantastic website, SOS for Secretary of State, dot MS, so now you know it's Mississippi, dot gov, and you know it's government, SOS dot MS dot gov is where you can find lots of information about voting next Tuesday. So vote, 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 vote. No, just vote once. <laughs> no, don't vote a bunch of times. Just vote once. This morning, we're talking about the public funds for private schools issue with our guest, Will Bardwell, Senior Counsel with Democracy Forward. Yeah, and it's a great discussion, Liz. I'm so glad we have Will here. And, you know, we were talking about standing. And one, one thing that uh, Will pointed out is the difference between standing at the federal level and the state level. And partly because we gave taxpayer standing at the federal level, then every time the Congress declared war or did something, spent money in a way that people didn't agree with, they would try to bring a lawsuit because we all pay taxes and we could say, well, that's how I have standing. So we need to have some kind of direct injury at the federal level. But you mentioned at the state level, it's much broader. And so let's talk about also, you know, is, is there anything, you know, arguably in the U.S. Constitution um, that would have, that was different from what was specifically in the state constitution uh, that is why you brought this case under the state constitution? Yes. So, you know, our country, everyone knows that uh, the United States has a constitution, but every state also has a constitution. Of course, the constitution of the United States sets up the framework for our federal government and the rights that citizens have uh, with regard to the federal government. State constitutions do the same thing. State constitutions set up the framework for state government in that state and provide the rights that uh, citizens have 
under that constitution. Sometimes they're exactly like the ones under the federal constitution. Sometimes they're a little bit different. One way that they are different uh, is about public education. So the United States Supreme Court has held, and a lot of people don't realize this, that the federal constitution does not protect a right to public education. Public education is a matter of state law, and every state constitution in America provides some sort of right to public education. And this is one of those things where from state to state, it can look very different. There are some states that have really robust requirements for public education in that state and require high quality education. There are other states that, uh, that have constitutions that say very little about what the legislature is required to do and kind of lets those legislatures do whatever they want to do uh, or as little as they want to do. And unfortunately, Mississippi is one of the latter states. Um, according to most people who look at these sorts of things, Mississippi's constitution has the weakest guarantee of public education anywhere in the country. Maybe that's a good place to jump off. I, I could I could keep going, but uh, but yeah, that sort of sets the um, the field for where we're going here. All right. So, what exactly did uh, the Mississippi Constitution say about programs like the Independent School Infrastructure Grant Program? Well, you know, the Mississippi Constitution, if you if you open it up or or just pull it up on the internet. Uh, and get down to, uh, I believe it's Article 8. That's the portion of our state constitution that deals with public education. And there are several different sections in Article 8. Some of them are quite ambiguous, meaning it's hard to read it and understand exactly what the constitution is allowing or requiring there. Other parts of it are unmistakably clear. So, one of the portions that is unmistakably clear is Section 208. In Section 208 of the Mississippi Constitution, uh, I'll read part of it here, the part of it that's relevant to this case, uh, and I think you'll see that you don't have to be a lawyer to understand what, uh, what, is, uh, what is being talked about here. So Section 208, um, in relevant part, says this, quote, No religious or other sect or sects shall ever control any part of the school or other educational funds of this state, nor shall any funds be appropriated, and it continues on, to any school that at the time of receiving such appropriation is not conducted as a free school. And so, in other words, the legislature cannot appropriate funds to any school that is not conducted as a free school. If the, if the legislature wants to appropriate money toward education, that money has to go toward public schools. Uh, you know, the law professors who study jurisprudence for a career uh, have, you know, they, they describe cases in different ways. You know, HLA Hart described uh, cases at the settled core and the penumbra. Jack Balkan at Yale just calls them easy cases and hard cases. This is an easy case. You know, no money means no money. A limit of zero dollars means zero dollars. And yet appropriating more than zero dollars is exactly what the legislature tried to do. And it was a lot more than zero, in fact. It was $10 million. So I have, a, I have a question about Mississippi's history. It, you know, and I didn't prepare well for this question. So this Bring constitution is over 100 years old. It is. Um, yes. So our constitution, I believe, is the oldest existing state constitution in America. It was written in 1890. It has been amended many times since then. Uh, but even states that are older than us have constitutions that are, are younger than ours. So this is just a little bit varying off topic. But when the council schools all started in, I think they were, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, when fun didn't public funds go to those? And if somebody withstanding had filed against that, would that have been illegal or is this apples and oranges? I don't think it's exactly apples and oranges. Um, there is remarkably, there is not much case law from that era. And the, the term case law, I just mean um, decisions that courts hand down that, uh, that operate as precedent. 
uh, there's not a lot of case law from that era concerning public money going to private schools. Um, and there is a case from the 1950s where the, uh, the legislature had established a program to loan textbooks out to uh, school children at both public and private schools. Uh, the Mississippi Supreme Court held in that case that, that was okay since it was going to both public and private schools. And there were other reasons that distinguish that from the case we're talking about today. Um, but remarkably, there, there aren't a lot of cases on this topic uh, from that era. I guess I just think in Mississippi, we're not, I, given Mississippi's history and the climate and the legislatures of the time, it, I, I, I'm surprised you just in, that this was something that was invented. I mean, this wasn't a a hidden Section 208. It's it's been a part of it. This isn't something new. I'm surprised this hasn't been pulled out and used more often. You know, there of course everyone knows there has been a great deal of uh, of litigation around access to public education in Mississippi for decades. But the overwhelming majority of that uh, of those cases have been in federal court, uh, and during that era, in particular, it's uh, most of it re revolved around desegregation, and so it, it could be that you know just the the bandwidth of the judiciary was consumed with uh, desegregation and uh, and related topics, and uh, and of course those would have all been happening in federal court, uh, and federal courts wouldn't have had jurisdiction over. Uh, cases arising under Section 208, which are matters of, of pure state law. See, that's why I love this show. We get we get some little history education. We get current events education. I, that's why I'm so glad MPB has in legal terms. And now that I've kind of pulled us off course, we'd love for you to email us your comments or questions. That address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're talking with Will Bardwell, senior counsel with Democracy Forward, about the recent ruling that giving pandemic relief funds to private schools for infrastructure improvements is unconstitutional. But it's also Election Day next week. So how and who can vote absentee in Mississippi's general election next week? I'm going to tell you that next. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill, and we hope that you'll subscribe to our podcast or find MPB Think Radio's recordings on our website, mpbonline.org slash radio. That has all the podcasts on it. This morning, we're talking about public funds for private schools with our guest, Will Bardwell, Senior Counsel for Democracy Forward. But we also want to remind you that next Tuesday is Election Day. So who can vote absentee, either by mail or in person? Well, you got to have a reason. That's the law. You have to have a reason. So under Mississippi law, the categories of people entitled to vote absentee by mail-in ballot any person who is temporarily residing outside of their county of residence, and the ballot must be mailed to an address outside the county, any person who has a temporary or permanent physical disability and who, because of such disability, is unable to vote in person without substantial hardship to himself, herself, or others, or whose attendance at the voting poll could place reasonably cause danger to himself, herself, or others, the parent, spouse, or dependent of a person with a temporary or permanent physical disability who is hospitalized outside of his or her county of residence or more than 50 miles distant from him or her residence if the parent, spouse, or dependent will be with such person on election day or if you're 65 years of age or older. The Secretary of State's website has lots of information about voting. We want you to be an informed electorate. And their Secretary of State's website is sos.ms.gov. And this morning, we are talking with Will Bardwell, Senior Counsel for Democracy Forward. Yeah, and it's, it's a great discussion. I'm glad we can continue you know, talking about this because it's such an important issue. But, I mean, one thing that I don't think people think about is that the state constitution 
can actually expand the rights given to you by the federal constitution and often does. And this is one of those cases where, you know, somebody could bring this case um, and, but it also limits rights of the, the legislature. And you, you and I were talking during the break, Will, but sometimes the law is just reading comprehension. And this seems like one of those reading comprehension cases. Um, so, um, yeah, I, uh, so we got standing and now you want to bring a remedy. And one of the things that when you file a lawsuit, you got to know what it is you're asking for, right? I, I, maybe I'm injured, but I got to know what I'm asking for. And a lot of times people ask for damages, but this wasn't a case where damages made sense. So you saw an injunction. Tell us a little bit about what an injunction is. So an, an injunction is a type of relief that uh, the courts refer to as equitable relief, as a opposed to damages, which are which is a form of legal relief. So if you ever go to court asking for what's called a declaratory judgment, or if somebody's doing something and you want them to stop, then you need an injunction. You're trying to enjoin someone from wrongful behavior. And so that's what we sought in this case uh, on behalf of our clients, uh, Parents for Public Schools. Uh, we, you know, damages... Damages wouldn't have done anybody any good. Uh, we just wanted the state to not actually spend this public money on private schools. That's simple. <laughs> <laughs> I should add also, you know, you mentioned, uh, Professor, that uh, we we did this case in Hines County Chancery Court. In Mississippi, we have two types of trial courts. We have circuit court and chancery court. If you, you know, speaking of elections, anybody who's ever gone to the uh the ballot on election day and looked at all these different types of courts. And say, well, what, you know, what's the difference between these courts? Circuit courts are courts of law. Chancery courts are courts of equity. And so if you have a case and you need a remedy at law, like damages, you file your case in circuit court. On the other hand, if you're like us and you needed a remedy in equity, like an injunction, uh, you file your case in chancery court. And tell us a little bit more now, what, what an injunction generally does is it stops certain behavior. Is it permanent? Is it temporary? How does that work? Yes and yes. So it depends on what kind of injunction you get. So imagine that uh, you live next to a guy who uh, who announces to you over the fence one morning, hey, by tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to come by and, uh, and just dump some nuclear waste in your backyard. It'll be fine. And you tell him, well, I don't want you to do that. I don't want any nuclear waste in my backyard. And he says, well, too bad. I'm going to do it tomorrow at uh, five o'clock. Well, you want to sue him, obviously, but it's not going to do you any good to litigate this case for three years and get to the end of the road and have a judge say, yeah, you remember that time three years ago when that guy dumped that nuclear waste in your backyard? He shouldn't have done that. That doesn't do you any practical good. You need something quicker. And so what you would do when you file your lawsuit at about the same time, you would ask the court with a motion to enter something called a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction. And both of those two things do basically the same thing, which is that they tell the other person in the lawsuit, the person whose conduct you allege is unlawful, it tells them to stop. For the, you know, for the time being, you have to stop until the judge has time to sort of wrap her arms around this problem and figure out if there is, in fact, good reason to believe that what's going on is illegal. Um, the big difference between those two being that a temporary restraining order only lasts a few weeks, usually. Uh, a, per a preliminary injunction generally will last the whole life of the lawsuit until the judge gets to the end and decides whether it's appropriate to enter what is called a permanent injunction, which just means, yeah, that, that thing you said you were going to do, you, you know, that nuclear waste you were going to dump in your neighbor's backyard, turns out you can't ever do that, that, that it will always violate the law. And so you, you, can't do that from now on. This this injunction is now permanent. And so that's so, what we were seeking in this case, is a permanent injunction. That makes sense, because that way it stops the harm before it happens, because as much as like, especially if they had made uh, these distributions to all these independent schools, it would have been hard to get that money back if it was already spent on whatever the school spent it on. So let's stop it from happening. And, and that's, that's what you did. Um, so let's ask this. I mean, the schools involved, at least some of them were, were certainly religious schools. Um, did that matter if they were religious schools under the Constitution? That is a great question. It also turns out it's a timely question because the United States Supreme Court 
addressed this uh, just a few months ago in June in a case called Carson versus Macon. So Carson versus Macon was a case that came to the U.S. Supreme Court from the state of Maine. And if you've ever been to Maine, you know that Maine is an incredibly rural state, even by Mississippi standards, just very, very rural. And there, there are large swaths of the state that are so sparsely populated, they don't even have public high schools that service some of these areas. And so the way Maine has handled that for a long time is they say, okay, we'll make public money available for you to attend private schools if you live in an area that doesn't have a public high school, but on one condition, you can't spend that money at a religious private school. And so someone in Maine wanted to. They wanted to, you know, they they lived in one of these areas. They wanted to spend uh, this public money on private education, but the school happened to be a religious school. And what the U.S. Supreme Court decided in Carson versus Macon in June was that the First Amendment forbade that qualification on Maine's system of, uh, of funding here. They, they said, look, if you're going to fund public education or private education at all, you have to treat religious and non-religious schools the same because otherwise you're effectively discriminating against religious schools because they're religious. Interestingly enough, Mississippi already does that. So Section 208 of the Mississippi Constitution, you know, drafted, gosh, 132 years ago now, has already done that for the past 132 years. Uh, When Section 208 of the Mississippi Constitution says can't appropriate any money to any school that's not operated as a free school, well, that applies to religious and non-religious private schools exactly the same, which is all the U.S. Supreme Court said in Carson versus Macon, is if you're going to treat religious private schools one way, you have to treat non-religious private schools the same way, or else we've got a First Amendment problem. It's interesting. Could, also, I, mean, I don't know that we know the answer to this, but could Maine now say, well, let's, we won't fund any of them? Absolutely, they could. In fact, there's, yeah. a, there's a line in the Carson versus Macon decision uh, that says exactly that. It says states are not under an obligation to fund private education at all. But if they do, they can't treat private religious schools differently than they treat private non-religious schools. But again, Mississippi already does that. Section 208 says that the legislature can't appropriate public money to any private schools. Yeah, it seems like one thing that uh, states could do if they've got remote areas that are hard to have public schools in is what we're doing right now. I am seeing you and Liz via Zoom. We're having this conversation, um, and we know that we can teach remotely it may not be ideal, but if we don't have a school at all in that area, it might be for, you know, those students might be the right way to fund it and still fund public schools. So there seems like we've got uh, ways to do it now that don't involve private schools at all. Just and a thought. Until we invent teleportation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Maine is a lovely state, but if I lived in uh, Aroostook County, Maine, uh, up along the border of Canada, and I got to teleport to school, I might choose somewhere other than somewhere else in Maine. I might choose a nice <laughs> sunny beach in uh, South Florida to teleport to uh, for a few hours a day. That's a good point. Um, we don't have that option yet. So now now we've got to look at, um, you know, so um, when you get this injunction, so now, now uh, and we had the Lieutenant Governor on last week, but we asked him this question. So now, um, what, what did the Hines County Chancellor Court say in, in issuing this injunction in terms of um, their reasoning behind issuing this injunction. Well, we mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that you know not all provisions of law are created equal as far as uh, how well they're written. Right, some of them are very clear and uh, and anybody can read it and understand exactly what that provision of the law is is saying. Other times, there you read a part of this of the constitution or some other statute and you think god i have no idea what that person could have been thinking when they wrote this law um the the judge in our case uh went about this like you would see in any other case with a clear straightforward statute uh, or other provision of law which is that you just you go through the text and you apply the text of that provision as it's written now, 
if a statute or a provision of law isn't clear, there are lots of other tools that judges can use to try to ferret out the meaning of that. But in cases like this, where the provision of law is unmistakably clear, all the courts do is go through and apply that plain language. And that's what the Hines County Chancery Court did here. Um, and very methodically, step by step, went through and, and applied that provision. Is there a reason you filed it in Hines County other than maybe you, you, you since you work for Democracy Forward and maybe you happen to live in the greater Jackson metro area, could it have also been uh, found a, what did you call it, the complaint? person in DeSoto County or in Harrison County? That is a great question. Uh, So Mississippi has a statute that says if you bring a lawsuit against the state, then you have to sue in the county where the seat of government is located. And so in Mississippi, that means Hines County. So if you're going to sue the state or a state agency, it's got to be in Hines County. Okay. Okay. We have one more section of In Legal Terms, so if you have a question or comment, go ahead and get those comments and questions in right now. Get those questions in to us on our email address, legalterms at mpbonline.org. We've been talking a little bit about how you can vote if you're going to vote absentee because next Tuesday is Election Day. What about those college kids? We'll tell you about that next. Hey, if you have missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show on the MPB Think Radio YouTube channel. What I think is so fascinating about this is that if you have any friends who are hearing impaired, if you listen to our podcast on the YouTube channel, it auto generates captions. So you could listen, I'm using finger quotation marks, air quotation marks, you can listen to MPB Think Radio, but just read it. So you could listen while you're somewhere out in public and don't have headphones, because you can just read the show over YouTube. But it's also available on the MPB Public Media app, as all of our local shows are. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Just saw her walk past at 11 a.m. Central on Tuesdays following our over-the-air broadcast. You can hear Southern Remedy, relatively speaking, with the fabulous Dr. Susan Buttress. That's on MPB Think Radio. So, college students. I've had three college students, and I've been one, and a lot of times they don't plan ahead. But maybe if they didn't plan ahead for next Tuesday's general election, they can plan ahead for the next one. You have two options in Mississippi. You can keep your voter registration at your parents' or guardian's house and either vote in that precinct or get a absentee ballot for that. Or you can register or just move your registration to vote at your school residence and put that address as your residence. Professor Gershon, it I hope you hammer home to your, I know you make sure your students get their wills done. I hope college students get registered to vote because half, you know, so many people don't. And that's, they're, they're part of the electorate now. And if you ever want to know more about elections in Mississippi, that Secretary of State's website, sos.ms.gov is a fantastic website. But that's next week. This morning, we're talking about public funds for private schools with our guest, Will Bardwell, Senior Counsel with Democracy Forward. Well, well, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, maybe our listeners don't understand is, you know, how all these things interact together. So you got you got the legislature enacting a law. That's the law, right? But then you got the state constitution saying something else, um, and, and the Hines County Court issues this injunction. So what does all that mean? How, which one takes precedence? Well, this is uh, this is uh, the the balance of power under our uh, under our constitutional system, right? This is checks and balances, just like we all learned about in high school. Uh, you know, the the legislature has its part of the of the law that it's in charge of uh, of creating and overseeing 
Uh, and that is the, the making of law. The executive branch executes that law, it applies it. Uh, but the judicial branch is the branch that interprets the law. And occasionally that means deciding that something the legislature did actually violates the Constitution and, and can't be allowed to remain in effect, which is what happened in our case. Well, it's so interesting because it's such, it is a kind of an amazing system when you think about it, because if we just had um, just the legislature, the, 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 the majority can make all the rules for everybody, purely. That's right. And so even, even if those rules discriminated or even if those rules uh, were unfair or mistreated the minority. So the Constitution protects all of us in an equal way and in a way protects us from that legislation, from that, that majority. Uh, and uh, but in this case, it, it's not necessarily that. In this case, really, the co the Constitution is saying public funds can be used only for public schools. That's right. Uh, that's, yeah. Now, could we put okay. So the Hines County Chancery Court is not the highest court in the state. It's an important court, but but could the state appeal this case? For sure. So uh, we are the way the the posture that the the case is in right now. Uh, and posture is just a word that lawyers use when they're talking about a case to describe sort of what what stage the case is at right now. Usually, at toward the end of any lawsuit, there are uh, what are called post trial motions, I mean, it's just sort of the way the the trial court tidies up the house before it uh, puts a bow on everything and and hands it over for whatever comes next. So the case right now about these. Uh, private school funding uh, chunks is uh, is in post-trial motions. After those are finished, uh, the court will issue what's called a final judgment. And that's exactly what it sounds like. That says, this case is finished. Here's who won. And it's usually just one page. Uh, so we'll get a final judgment. And once the final judgment is entered, that's when the clock starts ticking for the party who is unhappy about the outcome to appeal if they so choose. Now, I, I am expecting that the state will appeal here, but since we don't have a final judgment yet, uh, they haven't actually uh, begun that appeal. That, that started with uh, a document called a notice of appeal. That will be uh, filed with the Mississippi, well, it'll actually be filed with the trial court, but then sent to the Mississippi Supreme Court. In Mississippi, we have two courts of appeals, the Mississippi Supreme Court is the highest one. We also have one that is uh, a level lower, if you want to describe it that way, called the Mississippi Court of Appeals. The way that appeals are handled in Mississippi, the way they're administered, is that every appeal technically goes up to the Mississippi Supreme Court. But they send about 90% of those appeals down to the Mississippi Court of Appeals through a, a process that they call deflection. And so the, the Court of Appeals is not the highest court in the, in the state, but actually does most of the work when it comes to appeals. But since this is a, a case that involves a question of constitutional law, uh, and, uh, and this is the first time this, uh, this exact question has ever been posed, which, which you call it a novel question, uh, the, I, my expectation is that the Mississippi Supreme Court will just handle this appeal for itself without deflecting it to the Court of Appeals. Well, I have a question. I, I, from what you have said today from the nonpartisan Democracy Forward organization, it seems that this is a, a cut and dried statute. Why would the government of Mississippi appeal it? Well, the, the short answer is that they always appeal it. Oh, do they have <laughs> to? No, they, they absolutely do not. Uh, but it is, uh, I guess you could call it standard operating procedure to, uh, to fight these things uh, tooth and nail to the bitter end. It's not a waste of public funds. <laughs> well, I, that's between you and your elected leaders. Um, Which you should contact <laughs> if you have a question or an opinion that you want to share with your elected leader. <laughs> oh, but they, they, if, if the state loses something, anything, they usually appeal it. They do, usually. Uh, but they're not obligated to, which is why I say that uh, when the final judgment is entered, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, they'll have 30 days once the final judgment is entered to uh, file their notice of appeal. 
And uh, if they do, then we'll we'll get ready to start all over again at the Mississippi Supreme Court. Do you think it matters that this was pandemic funds? No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, there have been even other states that have explained that when uh, that federal COVID money uh, came into the state treasury, it was no longer federal money at that point. It was state money. All right. We have 30 seconds left. Professor Gershon, ask a question and make it good. But I, I mean, what would be their basis for appeal? I mean, the Constitution is pretty clear. It is. Uh, and I hope that the Mississippi Supreme Court agrees. They should. You know, we you hear people uh, gripe about courts sometimes and say, well, judges just need to do what the law says. You know, they need to call balls and strikes. Sometimes it's truly not that simple. Sometimes the laws are unclear and judges just have to do the best they can with what they've been given. Other times, like this, a pitch is very clearly out of the strike zone. Uh, this is one of those cases. This is a case where the legislature threw a pitch way out of the strike zone, and any fair-minded umpire ought to be able to see uh, that, that they're not allowed to do that. And on that sports note, we will end it. So thank you so much. Gosh, we've appreciated having Will Bardwell, Senior Counsel with Democracy Forward, to be on our show today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, we're so glad that we've got our team of Jay White, Lisa Lancaster, and our intern, Charles Arnold, on the show. And for our expert, Professor Richard Gershon, who hosts from the University of Mississippi School of Law, I'm Liz Gill. Please join us next Tuesday for MPB's In Legal Terms. Bye-bye. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.